Good morning, everyone. This is Keys to Understanding the Middle East. I'm Melinda McClymans with the Middle East Study Center at Ohio State U University. And today we're with Professor Yi Dakin on how World War I shaped Turkey and the Middle East. Um, and I'm just gonna give him a brief introduction before we get started. Um, he is the Associate Professor and Carter V. Finley Professor of Ottoman and Turkish History at Ohio State University. He earned his PhD at Ohio State University also in 2011. And he specializes in the history of the modern Middle East in general, not just, uh, not just Turkey. Um, and what's I think really interesting about his focus is that he includes social and cultural history. So people and daily life, and I, lo I love that. Um, and then he really, um, has a focus on the first uh, world war okay but also its aftermath um and also just before the world war because especially in turkey that that time period is very impactful um he looks at things like nationalism and social movements as well so he can actually connect to today uh, we're not really focused on uh on that um as much as World War One today, but who knows? Maybe we'll talk about current events if we have time. And um, he's also taught uh, at the College of Charleston and Tulane University, and he received the university's highest teaching award, the Weiss Presidential Award for Undergraduate Teaching. So it's always exciting to me to talk to a great educator as well. And um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Akin, and I'm just asking him to. Tell us why is World War One important to know about the Middle East? Uh, thanks so much, Melinda. Good morning, Good morning. Uh, and thanks so much for the generous introduction. Um, I'm I'm pleased to be with you this morning. Um, when we talk about when we think about World War One, uh, we usually think about the trench warfare in Western Front, um, and there is a reason for that. That's uh, that's the that was the center of gravity um, of the war, um, and continued to be perceived as such um, in the following decades. But we shouldn't forget one thing about the World War: it was a world war, um, and the German strategists um, realized this very early on. They coined the term "World War" because they realized that um, uh, empires on the both sides uh, were fighting globally. Uh, over imperial interests. Uh, so their colonial colonial possessions um, played an important role in their conduct of warfare. Um, there were strategic interests. There were, um, they relied on, especially the British and the French, relied on their uh, colonies um, uh, for material and human resources. So from very early on, it became clear that this was actually a global conflict. The British and French continued to use the term uh, the Great War until World War II, but the Germans from very early on coined the term World War and continued to use it that way. Um, I would say, of course, it was fought over uh, different continents, different areas, different regions around the world, but what made World War the World War is actually the conflict in the Middle East. So this was, um, uh, it was until recently, it was regarded as a sideshow um, of the real show in the Western Front. Mm, but that, that, per mm -hmm, that perception has changed um, over the, I would say, last two decades to three decades. And now um, we historians, um, uh, began to understand, analyze uh, the war in the Middle East um, for its own sake. And of course, in connection with the broader war effort. Uh, World War I in the Middle East, uh, here I would like to quote, there's a famous quote, uh, which I like to quote as well. Um, uh, the eminent Middle Eastern historian, uh, Jim Galvin of UCLA, uh, in his widely used textbook, um, argues that World War I, is the single most important political event in the history of the modern Middle East. So think about that. You know, the single, think about how eventful the modern Middle Eastern history is. Mm. And he argues that World War I actually is the single most important political 
event in the entire history of the modern Middle East. And it's interesting and, that he uses the term political. Could you explain, like, is that is that uh, significant or is, mm -hmm. is that a normal way we look at a war? No, I mean, uh, I mean in his own uh, original code, the political is italicized, actually. So he okay. underlines the political aspect of that. Um, in my own work, I would like to expand that. Um, and I, I try to expand it, but we'll come to that later. Um, what he means by that um, is actually World War I um, reshaped the entire region and brought about uh, the current state system that we live in. Um, so maybe uh, not right. all of our listeners, watchers, are not familiar with Middle Eastern history. Uh, but by 1914, there were basically two empires in the Middle East. So Ottoman Empire, uh, which was around since the Middle Ages, um, which was around by 1914, which was around for more than 600 years, and the Qajar Empire in Iran. Uh, uh, Egypt was, of course, under British influence. North Africa was under French influence. Um, uh, Libya was under Italian influence. But generally speaking, um, the, uh, the Fertile Crescent and Anatolia uh, were Ottoman domains. After the war, uh, and because of the Ottoman defeat in World War I, um, all of these areas uh, became first um, either independent states or mandate administrations, came under mandate administrations. And after World War II, they became independent states. So uh, all uh, most of the nation states that we know today in the Middle East were former um, Ottoman territories, Ottoman provinces. And um, uh, with the uh, with the end of with the defeat of with the Ottoman defeat in World War One, Ottomans uh, emerged out of World War One on the on, on the losing side uh, because they allied with Germany. Uh, mm -hmm. um, the Ottoman governments, Ottoman policymakers, realized that they cannot um, they cannot survive such a massive conflict on their own, and would like to strike an alliance uh, with either one of these uh, power camps in in Europe. Um, but in one of the power camps, there was Russia, the arch enemy of the Ottomans. So that was, even though they tried to, you know, attach themselves to that alliance, um, uh, they were rejected. But the Germans uh, and the Austro-Hungarians on the other camp um, had high hopes about the um, about the Ottoman Sultan Caliph's mm. uh, religious functions uh, and religious influence. So this was a wishful thinking. But uh, they basically saw Ottoman Empire um, uh, in that in that in that capacity. They saw that Ottoman Empire could be useful uh, for their war purposes, uh, for their war objectives. Okay. Um, so, and, are you saying? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Um, I got some chats, and so I I lost focus for a minute. Um, so the Ottoman Empire was figuring out where to situate itself when the Great War started, and um, ended up becoming an ally of Germany. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. but it was there a point where they were um, considering Britain or one of the other powers, but they didn't because of Russia being a part of that alliance. Is that do I understand that right? Yes, um, I mean they um, they did not have uh, a categoric decision for Germany. I mean they uh, they basically did in their capacity, everything in their capacity to strike an alliance with any one of these power camps. I see. So the important, important thing for them is not to, not to be alone, uh, not to be isolated in this war. Mm -hmm. um, but the, 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 the Entente powers, the British, French and, and Russians, saw Ottoman Empire as a liability. So the Ottoman Empire as not, a, not an efficient uh, military power, that would, and they thought that it would be a burden on them uh, to carry Ottoman Empire into the war. I see. Germans, Germans, on the other hand, thought very differently. Hmm. Um, as I said, they saw not because uh, they believe uh, in the Ottomans' military capacity, but they think they expected a lot from the Ottoman Sultan's religious influence uh, over uh, over the world Muslim world's Muslims. So. Uh, but that alliance, of course, 
you know, turned out to be a fateful one because uh, the central powers lost the war uh, and Ottoman Empire was on the losing side. Um, so, uh, but the interesting thing, um, interesting if you look from 1914, uh, both the enemies and the allies of the Ottoman Empire did not expect that, uh, that the empire would be on the battlefield um, for so long. Yeah. So the Ottomans, I mean, the Imperial Army mm -hmm. uh, remained on the battlefields all the way to the end. I mean, the Ottoman Empire signed armistice only 11 days before Germany did. So it remained, it remained, um, uh, it remained on the battlefields in a diminished form, of course, um, mm -hmm. because of the desertions and, and, the, and the battlefield casualties. But it remained in the battlefield all the way to the end. Mm -hmm. uh, but why, why do you think that is? I mean, does that prove that the British and the French were wrong to think they were weak in terms of like military uh, prowess? Or I mean, there were several reasons uh, for that. But I guess you know, the resilience of the Ottoman army was also an important important factor. But also, you know, I should add to that um, that uh, the, their main focus was still on was still on Europe. Um, and one important factor that we can complicate that that uh, that point is um, is the Russian Revolution. So, yeah. Um, in, in 1917. March 19, 1917, yeah. March yeah. 1917, if Russia, I mean, I argue that in my work as well, and other yeah. scholars argue that argue that as well, uh, if Russia, if the Russian Revolution did not happen, so Russia um, in 1917 probably would have knocked. Ottoman Empire out of the war. Um, so they were almost in the middle of, uh, they occupied maybe half of Anatolia from the eastern side. Um, and they were, there was nothing to stop them uh, to proceed and uh, end the war uh, for the Ottomans. But didn't happen. And uh, Ottomans remained on the battlefields all the way to the end, but this didn't help them uh, to win the war. So Ottoman Empire emerged out of the war as a loser on the losing side. As a vanquished power, uh, and that had a, a, a fateful mm. impact, a, a, a long-lasting consequences. Remember Jim Galvin's point: the most single, most important political event that's related to this defeat. Okay. So most of the Ottomans' uh, Arab territories, Arab provinces. Um, so if you consider today, right. if you think about the map today, uh, the modern-day states of Iraq, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon. Uh, Israel and Palestine, they all came under the occupation of the of the British, um, and to some extent French. Uh, by and nine, these and were these Ottoman territories before these, World War One. Exactly. For our audience these were, to clarify, and they were also um, predominantly Arabic speaking. Mm -hmm. You know, even though um, the center of the Ottoman Empire was Turkish speaking, and and what is now Turkey. Just to clarify mm -hmm. for a broader audience. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, um, these were mostly Arabic-speaking ethnic Arab uh, territories of the Ottoman Empire. Um, but the important fact is, you know, they've been under Ottoman administration for more than 400 years. So these areas, these, these territories became Ottoman provinces at the beginning of the 16th century. Mm -hmm. uh, so they've been under Ottoman administration for more than 400 years. And the, um, and the end of the Ottoman order... Uh, if you think about the, the longevity of the Ottoman administration there, uh, the end, the almost abrupt, almost sudden end of the Ottoman, uh, Ottoman role in those areas turned out to be a fateful development, turned out to be a critical development uh, for the Middle East. Mm. Because these, these provinces came under British occupation uh, and, uh, and it became immediately clear, even though Ottoman Empire did not dissolve in 1918, uh, it lasted a little bit more. Um, it ended in 1922. Uh, even though uh, the Ottoman Empire did not dissolve immediately, uh, it became immediately clear that the Arab provinces would not be given back to the Ottomans. So this implies a okay. new fate, a new future uh, for the uh, for the Middle East. So the end of the you know one important consequence of the entire and the entire war experience world war one and sometimes we forget that but uh, world war one is called 
uh, sometimes as the graveyard of empires. So mm -hmm. graveyard of empires, because the war um, led to the dissolution end of uh, four major uh, land empires. Russian Empire as a result of the Russian Revolution, but of course this was under the impact of the uh, under the huge impact of the Great War. Austria-Hungarian Empire mm -hmm. in the in the middle of Europe, right. which was composed of um, uh, numerous ethnicities and languages and and territories. German Empire, uh, which you know in nineteen by nineteen oh, by the right. end of the war. Uh, became the became a republic actually, uh, and finally the Ottoman Empire. So all these four empires could not bear the uh, huge burden of World War One. Uh, and you know, if you look from the world historical point of view, World War One um, uh, turns out to be one of the most important, most critical turning points. Yeah, I mean, it's really the end of an era, isn't it? I mean, of course. Mm -hmm. The way that you explain it, it makes me realize it, it was a real turning point for Europe as well, more than I oh. really think of. I think because, you know, being an American, um, our curriculum in school um, makes sure we learn about World War II, you know, mm -hmm. but a lot of times I think World War I sort of drops off the radar <laughs> and mm -hmm. it's definitely not as much in the media, you know, like History Channel and, you know, it's just like not as much in our consciousness, although there's still memorials. We've got a great World War One museum, you know, um, in Kansas City. Um, it's not that Americans don't know about it, but it's not as much in our awareness. So, so yeah. So basically, what you just said is like sometimes people talk about World War One as the graveyard of empires, mm -hmm. um, and when you look at those four empires you mentioned. It also makes you realize the Ottoman Empire, in a way, was a European empire. I mean, it actually was mm -hmm. literally. I mean, it was a part of what we call the Balkans now. Mm -hmm. So it's like these four major empires that spanned mm -hmm. across Europe and you know all throughout the Mediterranean and across you know that sort of religious boundary of Islam and Christianity as well. So that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, uh, that that's exactly right. And uh, let me say about your first point. Um, so that's, you know, we are trying to change it. So there is a growing and very vibrant World War I communities, community of scholars uh, now in the United States. And, you know, there's a growing interest in the, in the war uh, and also the American participation. I mean, don't forget the United States was an important actor in yes. World War I, as a latecomer to the war. Uh, but, you know, it, you know other, uh, American participation uh, turned out to be one of the most important uh, factors that brought victory uh, to uh, to the Allies. Um, but uh, you're right. I mean, World War One in the United States, in curriculum, in public opinion, in the collective memory, uh, remained always in the shadow of, shadow of World War Two. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, if you look deeper, uh, you'll you'll see you'll find out many. Um, important developments actually took place or uh, started um, started with World War One, and it's a pleasure. I mean, uh, so it's it's always a, a surprising uh, uh, development, a surprising realization uh, for my students to to see that World War One played such an important role in the entire global history. Um, because if you think about uh, the American, you know, once again, the American participation in World War One. Uh, United States joined the Allies, uh, or the Entente, as they call it uh, at the time, um, in April 1917. And President Wilson had a specific post-war vision, global vision, yes, uh, which he explained uh, or explicated in his famous 14 points. Mm -hmm. 14 points turned out to be um, such an important. Uh, or the general vision of Wilson turned out to be uh, such an important platform uh, for uh, for many many uh, ethnicities, uh, uh, ethno-religious communities around the world who were living um, under different empires um, in their request, in their demand for autonomy or independence. And this is an extremely broad range. And my colleague. Uh, uh, Erez Manela of Harvard University uh, in 2007 wrote a famous book 
uh, the Wilsonian moment, described the, uh, the global enthusiasm uh, showed, shown by uh, many different peoples towards Wilson's ideas um, as, as, as the Wilsonian moment. So, and those, you know, heightened expectations, of course, ended up uh, with a big, uh, with, with a big disappointment. So uh, yeah. Wilson, uh, Wilson's promises, Wilson's um, implications ex raised the expectations around the world so dramatically uh, uh, that the later turn of uh, events uh, brought so much disillusionment, so much disappointment, um, again, uh, in, the, in the global, in a glo global sense. And, you know, we, maybe we can come to this later, uh, but, you know, I cannot recommend enough uh, World War One Museum uh, in Kansas City, so it's a uh, it's a great great museum. I can you know I can uh, you know I'm uh, working closely with them. Uh, they have great educational programs, public uh, public programs, and the and as a museum, it's it's a great museum. So I cannot recommend enough uh, to visit and engage with the activities of World War One Museum. So I have a couple presentations if um, our listeners are interested to learn more about these subjects. I have. A uh, couple presentations Definitely. made there. Uh, they uploaded these to their YouTube uh, YouTube channels. Um, okay, so I'll I'll, I'll share a link of um, anything you want, like resources or things you provided. I will post that after we're done. So yeah, definitely send me those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we also Fantastic. have a growing growing community of scholars at OSU um, working on World War One. I mean, I have great colleagues in uh, in our department, in history department. Bruno Caban, for example, is one of the well-known, most well-known experts of the French experience, or generally speaking, European experience. Oh, okay, Europe. good to know. So, so there's a growing community of scholars uh, at OSU, and hopefully, we are becoming one of the most important centers of the study of World War One, um, global okay. World War One, um, yeah, around the world. I would say. Very interesting. But I mean, let me um, so uh, let me go back to World War One and the Middle East because you ask an important question, but I think I couldn't answer that fully. Um, so the end of the uh, the, the Ottoman defeat uh, in World War One and the British occupation uh, of the new territories brought about um, uh, or implied a new future, uh, a new fate for the, for these areas. One of the uh, one of the most important promises of Wilson in his 14 points was um, uh, to, uh, to ask the opinion of the local people, indigenous people, about their futures. So mm. the new colonial, colonial powers, imperialist powers, uh, should take, you know, as he, as, he, as he argues, as he implies, should take into consideration the local public opinion. So, mm -hmm. um, of course, this this also extend you know expanded the, uh, the, the increased expectations um, uh, from the post-war order, but the British and the French, uh, as two major imperialist colonial powers, did not have uh, any interest in that. Uh, but still, um, they felt they uh, need to reach a compromise with Wilson uh, and. This is why the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 turned out to be such an important moment, uh, again, in the modern history. Uh, that compromise uh, was uh, the introduction of a new administrative system into the Middle East. Uh, and this is called yeah. the mandates. Uh, the mandates, uh, or more accurately, uh, League of Nations mandates. League of Nations was one of the big dreams of Wilson, um, a mechanism, as he hoped, that would prevent any future wars uh, between the empires, between the nations, um, uh, by simply offering a platform for them to negotiate, to discuss, and solve their problems. Uh, well, this uh, turned out to be um, a, a, a very unfortunate uh, project for Wilson because U.S. Uh, did not join uh, the League of Nations, uh, which weakened the, uh, weakened the institution, weakened the organization from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, uh, 
the territories, uh, five territories uh, in the Middle East were given the British and the French, uh, Syria and Lebanon to French, Iraq, Jordan, Transjordan, and Palestine to the British as the League of Nations mandates. So they remained under the British and the French administration all the way to World War II. And then uh, these areas gained their independence, usually by negotiation, gained their independence and became independent states. So these are the states that we have uh, today in the Middle East. So this is what I meant that the end of uh, the Ottoman order, uh, World War One, spelled the end of the end of the Ottoman order and brought about the new state system, a new state system that's still with us today. The borders so, you know, see today. So basically, um, that's so interesting. Is, yeah. So like the, we take the borders that, that, that you know we take for granted that countries are nation states. You know, mm -hmm. and that you know they have borders, and we forget that in, in the that previous era they were more fluid, and now we have these you know, and and um, maybe I should pull up the map actually because the borders have such straight lines in the Middle East, and I don't know if mm -hmm. all of our um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all of our watchers uh, can bring those, it up to mind. And those borders turned out to be more uh, durable, resilient. Uh, uh, than they were expected to be. I mean, to, there were very little border changes in the Middle East. If you look into Middle East and the 20th century Middle East in history, there were very little border changes. And all these borders came into being as a result of World War One, as a result of the Ottoman defeat in World War One. And you said an important thing about the nation states. So uh, nationalism as an ideology was, of course, a product of the 19th century. Um, and the Middle Easterners were not different ethnicities in the Middle East were not unfamiliar uh, with the nationalistic ideologies. But there was, you know, when Ottoman Empire was around, there was a unifying framework, um, unifying uh, framework for the for different ethnicities, ethno-religious communities around the region. So first and foremost, everyone was an Ottoman citizen mm -hmm. uh, yeah. before the end before World War One. Regardless this, of whether they spoke Arabic or Persian or Turkish or um, Hebrew or whatever they spoke, yeah, in the Middle exactly, East. Exactly, exactly. I mean, sometimes we make a mistake uh, to think about the empires as nation states. They were not. They were very different uh, political entities. Um, the Ottoman Empire was no exception to this rule. It included um, several different ethno-religious communities, many, many different languages. And the, the, the imperial framework, um, despite all its difficulties, uh, kept these people together. Uh, but with the disappearance of, the, of that unifying framework, um, people look for, or the alternative identities, uh, alternative political identities became strengthened. Uh, so, you know, uh, it won't be wrong to say that the end of the Ottoman political order um, as a result of World War I uh, strengthened nationalisms in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, yeah. uh, people did not, I mean, this is something I try to emphasize in my own work, people did not become uh, diehard nationalists overnight. Uh, so these things don't happen that way. Uh, but but basically, uh, and and uh, and importantly, um, the disappearance of the empire or imperial framework made them more receptive to alternative uh, political futures, alternative political configurations. Okay, so, that makes sense. Um, and this is why we see, you know, let's say uh, immediately after the war, we see the emergence of several different. Uh, ideas of nationalism. Some of them are still with us today, some of them not. Uh, so, um, uh, and, you know, uh, that's another important consequence of World War I. And maybe we can add one more to this one, uh, okay. to, to, to this picture, is, uh, is the example of a successful, uh, successful example of a nationalist movement, and that's Zionism. So Zionism, like other uh, nationalist movements, was a product of 19th century. Um, 
but it was actually World War One and World War One developments during World War One, which added political importance Zion, to Zionism. For the first time, uh, some of our listeners or watchers are maybe familiar with that. In November 1917, Zionism received its first and I would say most important uh, great power support uh, in the case of the Balfour Declaration uh, from Great Britain. So, right. uh, which made Zionism or the future of Zionism um, almost certain, almost, um, and each guarantees that it would survive uh, in uh, in post World War One uh, world. Um, so, and 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 as you know. Um, that turned out to be a very faithful development uh, for the entire Middle East, but also specifically for uh, for Palestine, um, a, a problem, unresolved problem that's still with us today, um, uh, is, each, each is actually um, a, a product of World War I. Uh, itself. So, so basically, so. there was a promise made, or kind of a maybe not a promise, but a declaration made by Lord Balfour that there should be um, some kind of settlement in Palestine that would be a homeland for mm -hmm. Jewish settlers. Uh, I guess from around the world, um, mm -hmm. based on you know the 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 burgeoning national movement that was partly religious, but also the, in the Jewish communities around the world, there was a growing movement to form a state, like a political movement mm -hmm. as well. And yeah, so mm -hmm. 1917 then was both the Russian Re Revolution and the Balfour Declaration and before the end of World War One. So yeah, that's huge for the Middle East. It is. I mean, it, it, there are many, uh, many, many important, I mean, you know, some of them uh, we discussed, but World War One turned out. This is something I a, a comparison I made with uh, with the Civil War, American Civil War, in my classes. Um, so I say my students, World War One to the Middle East is what American Civil War to United States is. Uh, so such an important critical mm -hmm. development, mm -hmm. such an important critical moment uh, in this. I mean, think about the importance of uh, Civil War in the modern U.S. history. So World War One. Uh, is comparable. The importance of World War One for the Middle East was is comparable uh, to uh, to that experience. Um, so, and, and when I think of um, when I think of the Civil War, I mean, um, I don't know if typical Americans do. I don't necessarily represent all Americans, <laughs> but I think of trauma, and I think of like you know, kind of stere stereotypical stereotypes like brothers fighting brothers and the division mm -hmm. of the country and everything like that. Um, mm -hmm. Would you say, and, and this is a, an intentional segue to something else I wanted to ask you about. Would you say World War I um, like is still felt in terms of that historical trauma? Um, to some extent, yes. Um, but I would say not as an individual trauma. I mean, it, well, I mean let me complicate. Let me, uh, let me take a step back and, and complicate this. It depends. It okay. depends where you live in the Middle East. Um, so, because some um, in uh, a project, one of the projects that I'm working nowadays is the uh, the memory of World War One in the post-Ottoman Turkey. Um, so, in Turkey, World War One, at least in official discourse, uh, was a completely forgotten episode. So, there is a very intentional, okay. conscious, official oblivion, official policy of wow. oblivion. Uh, and there is a reason for that. I mean, we can explain um, the, that 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 insisted persistence on forgetting uh, World War One is, um, as you know, right after uh, the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, uh, Turkish nationalists um, under the leadership of Mustafa Kemal, later Atatürk, uh, fought a successful war of independence, successful national struggle. Um, against the occupying Greek army and their uh, and their British patrons, um, and as a result of that successful war of independence, a, a new secular uh, independent republic, Turkish Republic, emerged was established in 1923. So that republic needed a new history, 
um, and were won for that, even though, I mean, ironically, um, even though many of the founding fathers, the founding figures of the Turkish Republic themselves were veterans of World War I, um, they uh, did not want to emphasize that experience. They, mm. their, their vision, their focus was uh, towards the future. And World War I for them was a, uh, was a war of uh, a bygone era, uh, was, a, as well, was a war um, and the lost war uh, for them, of course, lost war of a collapsing empire. I but, see. That makes sense. Uh, yeah. Okay. But if you, if you look at the uh, the Arab provinces of the empire, where one all the way up to today occupies a very central place, both in public memory, in collective memory, and also the education uh, and the curriculum. And this is true for Iraq, this is true for Syria, Lebanon, uh, because World War I for them, uh, or from the official, uh, from the point of the official history, World War I represented um, a critical breakthrough, a critical breakthrough which uh, symbolizes uh, centuries long Ottoman uh, tyranny uh, over these provinces. Hmm. Uh, and World War I for them, exemplified that tyranny and and you know since the Ottoman since the Empire came to an end um, it represented a breaking point uh, it represented a, a, a watershed moment for them okay. and, and there was another reason uh, that it becomes such and that it occupies such an important role in both uh, collective memory and official historiography is the Arab revolt Arab revolt of 1916 Again, uh, a famous World War One development, made even more famous by Lawrence of Arabia, of course. Mm -hmm. yes. Um, yes. So I cannot recommend enough to watch that 1963, 64 movie. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, with all its yeah. Orientalist cliches and everything, right. uh, but it's still fun to watch. Uh, and this is the something I amazing. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, as a as a, as a cinematic pro, uh, production, it's an amazing movie. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, watch it. Consciously, of course, mm -hmm. um, but I cannot recommend enough. You know, this this the whole Lawrence business uh, made it uh, much more important. Made made it look much more important than actually it was. I mean, Arab Revolt was a minor nuisance for the Ottomans, so it didn't. Okay, uh, okay. I see. All right. And the urban Arab populations did not really participate in the Arab revolt. Um, it remained, its impact remained very limited. Um, you know, as I said, it's, it's basically a nuisance uh, for, the, for the Ottomans. But, I mean, those kind of nuisances, even though uh, they were minor and limited, um, official histories needed this kind of, this kind of incidents. So the Arab revolt that limited uh, more or less uninfluential incident was taken and integrated into the official histories of these newly emerging nation states as a great moment, as a heroic moment where the Arab people for the first time um, raised the flag of resistance towards the Ottoman Empire. Um, so it, it, it came to be, uh, it was reinterpreted as a moment uh, where the Arab people showed collective resistance, um, which eventually uh, contributed to the defeat of the Ottomans. Um, and this is why uh, it occupies such an important role in uh, in the official curriculum. Mm. Uh, so this is why in, I... In Turkey or the US? I mean... No, is... this is for the Arab-speaking provinces. Um, okay, gotcha, the, gotcha. I mean, the, the Arab nation states in the Middle East today. So in school, they do learn about the Arab revolt. Mm. Oh, okay. They do learn a lot about Arab revolt. Um, uh, but I mean, memory, collective memory is not a static thing. I mean, it changes over time. Uh, okay. So that policy of official oblivion uh, is a thing of the past now. And, you know, starting with, I would say 1960s, uh, there's a new policy or new movement towards remembering of World War One and World War One experiences in Turkey as well. And after uh, 2002 or so, you know, with the coming of AKP into power, um, it was 
uh, it, it was made uh, the, the focal point of history education um, in Turkey. Uh, hmm. I mean, uh, World War One so, experiences. Um, how does that work? I mean, so basically they they teach about it alongside like the war of independence because i mean the, maybe i should back up i think what i understood you saying is that turkey had to really look forward especially to win the war of independence and that's one of the reasons they said that's the thing like world war one's over let's we need to move on and focus on today and then that was reflected in the national consciousness for a long time mm -hmm, so it mm -hmm. kind of has to do with a does it have to do with a focus on the the war of independence like the national like the national war that formed turkey mm -hmm. or or is it just something no else? at the beginning it was that at the beginning okay. i mean new nation states and new 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 historical narratives right every nation state has its own uh historical narrative uh, you need a convincing narrative to teach your children in primary, secondary schools, right? Mm -hmm. High schools. Um, so for the uh, for the new Turkish nation, Turkish, Turkish nation state, uh, that narrative was focused on the war of independence and the establishment of the uh, re republic, uh, the republican regime in Turkey. Right. So okay. this is why everything uh, that happened before that moment uh, was interpreted very carefully. Uh, and pretty much disregarded, especially if they were, if they were uh, not victories, if they were not something to be proud of, like World War One, for example, uh, they were pretty much disregarded. Okay. Um, but you know, uh, um, my research also shows that um, uh, there is a huge discrepancy between the official oblivion and uh, the public uh, or individual remembering of the war, hmm. even though the new Republican regime encouraged um, the forgetting of uh, the uh, previous experience, the World War One experiences, uh, people uh, who were who either participated or were affected uh, by World War One uh, did not could not forget it. So. Uh, and they kept memoirs, they wrote about their experiences, did not publish them, and their publications waited all the way to 2000s. So the... Oh, uh, I love, the, I the, love the, um, primary sources. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. there are a lot. Uh, yeah. And now, I mean, we didn't think at the beginning, uh, if you ask anyone, let's say, in 1970s, um, they would give you the answer that those memoirs, diaries that we have um, a lot in European history, for example, uh, do not exist in the Ottoman Empire. But you know, oh. fortunately, fortunately, we were wrong. I mean, they were uh, there were hundreds of them. Uh, yeah, sure. uh, hundreds of them written sure. all over the Republican era, um, either by people who parted, as I said, who directly participated in the war by veterans themselves, or by their relatives uh, on the home front, uh, much less so. But I mean, still, we have some examples of that. But they were not published, so they were kept in, you know, family archives. Probably many of them lost as well in this process. Um, but with the change of uh, the ideological climate, political climate, they began to be published uh, with 1990s, and today we have literally hundreds of them. And our library, OSU Libraries Collection, is one of the best, I would say, in the United States to have many of those memoirs. Um, so, and we continue cool. Good uh, to, to know. purchase. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah, our our library um, is, I hate to brag, but I guess that is sort of what this channel's for. Um, it is an amazing library. Um, it is. It is indeed. I mean, it's, it's probably one of the best mm. life collections when it comes to the Turkish or Turkey-related sources. Uh, we have a great Middle Eastern librarian, great Middle East collection. Uh, so, so in that sense, I mean, we are, uh, we are lucky. Um, we have a question that just came in. Um, Chala, my friend from college, actually. Hey, Chala. Um, she wants to know if you can recommend any authors to kind of read up on these subjects. OK, um, so yeah, I can recommend. Uh, many of them, and uh, many of them are my, you know, 
personal friends and, and colleagues. So the best, I think, you know, I, I can I can recommend my own book as well, of course. <laughs> definitely, um, <laughs> I'll definitely share that. <laughs> so this is, you know, my my own work is um, is you know more on the civilian aspects of World War One. So this was uh, this was something I was about to say, but then then forget. I mean, we talk about so many different things, but um, uh, the emphasis, scholarly emphasis on the World War One and the Middle East has been on political and military aspects until pretty recently. Only in the last decade, uh, we realized that the war had a huge civilian aspect, civilian dimension as well. Uh, so I tried to, you know, I wrote my dissertation on that subject, the, the civilian experience of World War I uh, in the Ottoman Empire uh, and the broader Middle East, and then, you know, published that as a book in 2018 with Stanford Press. That is such an important work. I just, I just um, need to brag for you on it because I, I know it's, you know, hard to to do that when we're talking about our own work. But yeah, everyone should totally check that out because um, it goes into the experience of the war, like how people experienced it, and not just in the battles, but like if you think about it, the battles happen throughout the whole society because everyone is. Uh, stranded without all the you know the men who left for the war so they don't mm -hmm. have their help in the household anymore it also can cut off supply lines and food so people are starving it's it's Good. really um an immense an immense uh, impact on the whole society that you know is very traumatic um mm -hmm. Uh, and, and just very impactful at so many different levels and that's actually what um professor Akin goes into he, he gives the complete picture. Like it's not that he just focuses on that, but he gives um, social, cultural, and historical, you know, events. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that you can really understand more about the experience, which I really like because I like teaching through the lens of culture. Mm -hmm. And so that mm -hmm. people understand a different perspective and it's not just one event that mm -hmm. change the tide of the nation states, although it's really important, but like, you know, it gives you kind of um, a way of thinking about the world differently. Like there's different experiences in the world, there's different perspectives. And so I think it's super important for people to, to have access mm -hmm. to that, mm -hmm. the, like yeah. daily life. Like, what did it mean for people, you know? Mm -hmm. That, that's exactly, that question is exactly what I try to answer. I mean, you know, we know relatively more about the political aspects. As I said, you know, we've been talking about the political importance, not that they are not important. I mean, they were extremely important. Um, you know, the most important political event in the history of the modern Middle East. But, um, the, but it was relatively unknown what people experienced on the home front, actually. Um, so what happened to to people when they lose their uh, their families, major breadwinners? Um, so what happened uh, to their animals, for example? I mean, I try to integrate the story of the animals uh, into my understanding of World War One. So there is a, a great German historian, retired now, Roger Chickering, um, who wrote a great book about one city, Freiburg in Germany during World War One, So it's thick as break. Uh, but in, in his introduction, he argues that total war, which World War One is certainly the most, uh, uh, the, the first uh, example, uh, total, war, total war requires total history. So he means that we have to, to be able to understand that uh, the total or totalizing experience, we have to look into every single aspect of, of life. Um, be it politics, be it society, be it literature, be it religion, um, you name it. So I cannot claim that I did all of these, but, uh, but at least I try to integrate more of these uh, areas into our discussion of World War One. But let me, uh, let me answer uh, Charles' question uh first i mean the uh, i still think the uh the single best volume on the broader uh world war one experience uh in the middle east is eugene rogan's eugene rogan's the fall of the ottomans 
so 2015, if I'm not wrong, he published this book, became an international bestseller, The Fall of the Ottomans. Okay. Uh, and it's Eugene Rogan? Eugene Rogan of uh, St. Anthony's College at Oxford University. Uh, okay. I mean, himself is an excellent writer, of course. And this book, uh, The Fall of the Ottomans, provides um, a broad perspective. Um, I mean, to be honest, the emphasis is more on the political aspects, uh, but still uh, extremely accessible without dumbing down mm -hmm. this subject, this mm -hmm. complicated subject. Um, Rogan provides the, the best introduction uh, to World War I in the Middle East. Also, um, if you are interested in uh, the civilian aspects, um, I can also recommend, you know, mine is more, uh, honestly speaking, you know, mine is more um, Tur Turkish speaking uh, parts of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, but for the Arab speaking regions of the, uh, the Arab provinces of the empire, I can recommend Leila Fawaz, um, Tufts University professor, Leila Fawaz, uh, The Land of Aching Hearts. Land of Aching Hearts. Land of Aching Hearts. Uh, the Middle East in the Great War. Publish. Oh, that's Fawaz. like that's a that's land of part of her title. Right. Yeah, okay, it's part of a, a land of aching hearts. The Middle East in the in the Great War. So excellent. Those are great the, references. Thank you so much. And Chala also mm -hmm. says thank you. And um, yeah, I mean, while we're on the topic of books. Um, uh, I was going to ask you about where did you have to go to do your research to get all mm. the detailed information? Did, did you have to go uh, to special archives to find like these primary sources like journals, letters, mm. memoirs and things like that? And was it exciting? Did you have any interesting uh, experiences there? Oh, it's, it's totally exciting. I mean, you know, uh, so I can answer that one. Uh, that one very easily. I mean, you know, that's probably for historians, professional historians or amateur historians as well. My students experience that excitement as well. Uh, so it's it's a super exciting uh, thing to go to uh, archives, discover new things, um, which sometimes lead to your reinterpretation of the events uh, that you think you know very well. So that's I cannot imagine anything more exciting than this. Um, but it's also a very exhausting process. So working in the archives is, so there's a reason I have these gray hairs. So I'm not very old, but my hair is already gray. So it's, <laughs> most historians are like that. Uh, so there's a reason for you that. You earned them, you uh, earned each one. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I take it as a compliment, thank you. Uh, but uh, I mean, writing a total history of the war um, requires uh, the use of many different sources. So um, since I try to look at the you know, st state society relations as well, uh, I use bunch of governmental materials and uh, different correspondence, uh, correspondence between different uh, branches of the government, between mm. civilians and the army, um, etc. And these could be found in the Ottoman archives in Istanbul. So okay. we have one big centralized archives um in Istanbul uh, so and the Ottoman documents could be found there but there were also um, other archival facilities uh, which help us uh, to get more sense about to make more sense of the Ottoman experience one of them is for example the the national archives in London so this is the official British archives uh, which house I mean British like they did, you know, all around the world were very careful uh, observers uh, of developments. They have access to different levels of government uh, and produce important reports, um, again, mostly about the official activities of the governments and governmental officials. But generally speaking, these are very useful uh, archival materials. I also find, uh, but the problem you know, studying World War One and the problem with the British archives for from the Ottoman point of view, um, British became the enemies of the Ottomans. 
So after the after October 1914, when the Ottoman officially entered the war, uh, the utility, the usefulness of the British archives diminish to a certain extent, because they were all the British officials were expelled from the country. Mm -hmm. um, they don't have that much access anymore to governmental mm -hmm. uh, to governmental officials. So the usefulness diminish gradually over time. But, you know, we are lucky here because the Americans uh, never became official enemies with the Ottomans. So even though United States entered, uh, uh, entered the war on the side of the, on the side of the, uh, the Antant, the enemies of the Ottoman Empire, uh, US never officially declared war uh, against the Ottoman Empire. So that was an important distinction that was oh, wow. yeah, you know, that's declared. Cool. Uh, my good friend Andrew Patrick uh, wrote a great article about this, so I can provide in uh, Diplomatic History a couple of years ago, and he talked about several different reasons why Wilson hesitated and eventually gave up the idea of declaring war on the Ottoman Empire. So I can also recommend that one. I can send the, the exact uh, reference if you want, Andrew Patrick. Yeah, that'd be uh, great. Uh, uh, but you know the, the the good thing about this is the uh, the American archives uh, is very because of that is very very useful uh, for uh, studying uh, the Ottoman experience because the Americans were still in the Ottoman Empire uh, both for diplomatic and you know for other functions for educational for missionary or for whatever uh, mm -hmm. functions. And for example, uh, we, we didn't have a chance to talk about this, but uh, the Americans uh, in the countryside, I mean, these are American educationers and uh, educators and missionaries, uh, turned out to be uh, more, you know, most accurate observers of the Armenian genocide. Mm. So uh, their reports, the reports they produced, they wrote from the lock, from these distant locations of the empire to um, to the to the uh, to the ambassador in Istanbul uh, today uh, offers extremely useful first-hand uh, observations about the conduct and the impact of the genocide oh wow so American archives in that sense uh, uh, Maryland College Park Maryland yeah, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't have guessed yeah that's so interesting yeah the American primaries were important. Yeah, I mean, American archives in that sense is uh, very efficient uh, working uh, conditions. I mean, not all archives have that equally uh, efficient working conditions, but American archives, I guess, industrialized, quote unquote, uh, yeah. the, the system of uh, uh, system of archiving. So, and they they represent very very um, uh, they they present very very important information to uh, to to scholars studying uh, the Middle East and World War. But there were, of course, you know, as I said, more like you know individual documents like the diaries and memoirs, and petitions written by people by ordinary people uh, from their hometowns to go to several governmental officials, or you know uh, one. Uh, one aspect, one sort, one one group of sources that I used in my work, um, and I like, and I hear good things about that, uh, is are the folk songs, for example, the folkloric material. Also yeah. include uh, lots of information, uh, or uh, lots of information. So uh, people sort of, you know, um, using their artistic expression to to also talk about what was happening around them, I guess. Right. I mean, they express their feelings about the war in general or the lost lost ones. I mean, their lost fathers or, you know, fiancés or sweethearts or whatever. They express the agony. Uh, they experience the sadness uh, on the gravity of the war in general uh, in, in folk songs. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Uh, and the reason is the level of literacy is very low in the Ottoman Empire, uh, was very low in the Ottoman Empire. So it may be around 13%, 10 to 13%. Uh, so this is why uh, we have much less written material, especially from ordinary people, from ordinary Ottomans. Uh, 
Um, but, you know, I try to compensate that lack, uh, that lacuna with, by using this kind of, quote unquote, alternative uh, historical, uh, That's historical materials. Yeah, I mean, if it was like in the folklore, then it's kind of a more shared experience. So it's, yeah, it's, that's a nice source. So this is, you know, uh, this is why I could argue, you know, remember uh, when I said there's a huge discrepancy between uh, the policies of official oblivion and the public remembering. So the, this folkloric material, the folklore, the, the songs, uh, folk songs uh, continue to be collected uh, decades after the war, mm. which shows, it, it shows, it serves as an indication uh, of the vibrancy of that memory among people. I mean, otherwise, how would you collect that? How is it possible to collect folk songs about uh, about World War One? Let's yeah, say in nineteen sixties, nineteen seventies. Has to resonate with people. It re has to resonate and has to survive. Uh, so this is probably from generations to generations they sang. Many probably in that process of transmission got lost, uh, but you know, still the existing ones gives us an idea that the, that memory, that collective memory, is vibrant enough uh all the way i would say to 1960s or so vibrant enough um shows us that people continue to remember uh the war in all its sadness um uh, and, and and difficulties yeah uh, so i also love you quoted a woman who was writing complaints i think um mm. it's like e just either throw us in the sea or stop this war or something like what did she say i don't remember but that was great that really uh, brought the personality of people into it and their, but also their suffering and what they're experiencing made it so real, you know? Um, there was so, just to give context to the audience there, one of the highlights in the chapter on, I think women actually, um, and, and kind of gender and how that was, it was different, you know, for depending on your gender, like how you experienced, um, the war. Um, it, you know, it talks about the complaints women had, and I mean, they were really going through tough times. So he he quotes one of the women in a complaint. I guess she was writing it to the like to the Sultan or to the government. Uh, probably to uh, Minister of Interior. So the the you know in in his own I mean in that section of the archives you find many of these petitions, and women um, wrote with uh, uh, unprecedented. I mean, I cannot, I cannot underline enough unprecedented um, determinism uh, and and um, and you know anger in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, in a sense, I mean, they were basically implying, and they always signed or sealed their petitions, their letters as um, as soldiers' families, soldiers' mother, or soldiers' wife, something like that. As if it's, I mean, it's it has become apparently a collective title for them. And they basically imply sometimes very explicitly, sometimes implicitly, that we sent, look, we sent our children, our fathers, our brothers, uh, our husbands to the war. And you promised us um, that you will take care of us in their absence, but you are not doing this. Um, so, and they are asking, you know, whatever they ask. I mean, either they complain about a local official or they ask for more material help from the government, but they use that um, that strong language uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, demanding, uh, yeah. not pleading, but de demanding. demanding. I mean, this is, but there is an implicit it, like, contract. We're fed up. We've had it up here. We're done. Right. I mean, yeah. it's, and I mean, not something they are begging for, but this is basically, they're implying that there is an implicit contract between them and the state. I mean, you are, you know, asking, this is, you know, I, I have studied other wars of the empire as well, but this is something that I have seen for the first time with such a frequency. In almost all petitions, letters I read uh, from women, there is that implication. You know, sometimes, as I said, more explicit, sometimes they are saying this explicitly, uh, sometimes more implicit and disguised, but in, in all of them, um, otherwise, why would you sign your uh, petition or seal your petition as a soldier, soldier's wife? Um, so That's that really implies it. such an expectation. There's a uh, lot from, to unpack there. Yeah. A lot, yeah. 
Well, that so is there are, I mean, fortunately, in the, in the uh, there are more uh, nowadays, I mean, the last couple of years, there are more specialized studies on women and World War One. So mine is just one chapter. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, there are more specialized studies on different aspects of women's experience in, in war. Um, so uh, our listeners, our watchers could also find them in, in our library as well. Excellent. Excellent. And then... Um, what what courses are you teaching, um, either mm -hmm. upcoming or just that you you will be teaching in the future that um, we can share with students at Ohio State if they're interested? Mm. No, that, that that's great. I mean, I uh, plan to teach. This is my um, first semester of teaching, so uh, I'm not actually first semester. I was a TA here years ago, and I taught my own classes in Rhodes Oh wow! Nice. First semester as a faculty. I mean, let's say the first semester as a faculty. Yeah. Um, so uh, I uh, teach uh, a broad survey uh, on the Middle Eastern history. Uh, so Middle East, the Middle East since 1914. This is history 2353, um, which I plan to teach on a regular basis and want to make it as one of the foundational courses of our entire Middle East curriculum um, here at OSU. So, because, you know, we all need, regardless of what we do, regardless of where we are, uh, regardless of the field, where we concentrate, specialize, do major, minor, that kind of basic foundational understanding of modern Middle Eastern history is essential, mm. I believe. And, you know, uh, I hope uh, the students will think the same way. Uh, so this is a class that I will teach, you know, at least once or twice uh, in a year. Uh, but I also teach, in addition to that broad survey, I also teach, um, occasionally I may teach uh, the broader history of Islam. Um, so this is history 2350. Um, so Islam, uh, uh, politics, society, politics and society in history. But I also teach, I also plan to teach, you know, for the first time I will teach, for example, in, in the fall, um, upper level classes, more specialized okay. research seminars. And, you know, uh, it makes sense uh, together with this, with this podcast, uh, the first research, specialized research seminar uh, that I will teach is on uh, World War I and the making of the modern Middle East. So this is history 4375. Uh, research seminar in um, four, two, three, Islamic four, four, three, uh, 4375. Okay. 4375. So um, I plan to teach several of these uh, research seminars and this one, the first one will be on the World War I and the, and the making of the modern Middle East. And in that class, we will read uh, monographs in the form of articles and books or book chapters about several aspects of the war experience um, and the establishment foundation of a new Middle East in the aftermath of World War I. And students will write, uh, will produce a research paper or a historiographical paper um, for, the, for, for this class. So this is an upper level uh, seminar uh, in history. Got I it. plan to teach several others of these, like um, maybe you know some specialized courses on on modern Turkey, Ottoman Empire, and modern Turkey, um, religion and nationalism in the modern Middle East. Those kind of broader, uh, uh, but more specialized uh, research seminars as well. Very exciting! Very exciting. And we only have a few more minutes, but I definitely want to um, find out if there's any, like what you're working on now or any projects you want to share. Um, yeah, I mean, one of them I mentioned, that's the about <clears throat> the memory of, of World War One in the Middle East, uh, in, in post-Ottoman, uh, mostly post-Ottoman Turkey, and try to understand, try to focus on that discrepancy that I mentioned between the official oblivion and the individual and local remembering. Mm. So I, I try to see, you know, different aspects of that. I try to discuss different aspects in uh, in a conversation uh, with, with the broader literature. So this is one 
subfield, exciting subfield of World War One studies, the memory of and memory of the Great War. Um, so I'd like to contribute to that one, mm -hmm. and I'm also writing. Uh, so I guess more immediately, I'm working on uh, a second monograph, uh, which is a sequel to my book, um, but focuses on the last years of the empire, the twilight years of the empire. Because unlike the Russian Empire, Austria-Hungary, and German Empire, the Ottoman Empire continued uh, four more years after the World War One, after the after the First World War, well, between yeah. 19, 1918 and nineteen twenty-two. So I think this is a uh, super exciting period. I mean, difficult to live, but super exciting for historians. Um, so I I have a you know tentative title for that: um, after the empire, before the nation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I, I, I try to focus on intellectual, social, cultural uh, developments in that period. Um, so I'm working on these simultaneously on these two projects. I mean, they are not too separate from one another, of course. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, so, the memory of World War One. Um, are you? Um, is there anything we should look forward to, like presentations or anything we should be on the lookout for for either of those? Um, well, I mean, I, I have done one of these presentations at uh, University of Texas, um, but maybe, yeah, in the future, sure, we can we can do that. I would love to come and oh yeah, uh, talk about that as well. I mean, I I should proceed a little bit. I mean, I should I should develop a little bit more. Okay, um, my ideas about that. So I'm not, you know, th that that's still in the draft form. I mean, it's not. Um, uh, I need to work on it a little bit more. Then I would be very happy to come and talk about this project as well. Let's plan on it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so great to speak with you for this past hour. Or so same here. Same here. Yeah, and um, before we wrap up. Um, we could maybe, oh, we have someone saying, I really enjoyed your talk. It's Chala, <laughs> Chala Ozgoren. Mm -hmm. She's saying, thanks so much. She says, can you see the Turkish? Turkum diene. Uh, that, that's a famous uh, motto of the Turkish Republic, right? You know, how happy one says um, that oh, I'm a Turk. to be Turkish, yeah. Be Turkish. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that. Thank you very much. So, um, so yeah, so I think we're way over time, so we better wrap up. Is there anything else you want to leave people with? Uh, I would like to thank uh, for inviting me. So it's a pleasure always to talk about this. And you know, uh, let's let's plan more. Let's get in touch. Uh, so you know, especially as I proceed a little bit with my research um, in coming years, coming months, we can do you know something else. And I uh, I appreciate um, uh, if. Uh, if if you um, if you publicize this, I I know you do lots of uh, publicizing, but you know, uh, I think students will find it, and you know, maybe broader public will find it very very useful. Um, so, plan to make more of these podcasts. Oh yeah, there'll be another one in two weeks. Um, I am going on vacation next week, um, so I will be a little bit out of touch, um, but uh, I will be following up with you to. And I need to get that done before Friday and I leave town just to share out with everyone the books you shared and uh, kind of wrap it up that way um, so people know where to look. We have another thanks from Kevin Reikley. Um, and uh, yeah, we, I, I, I also thank you so much because I know, you know, research is um, very consuming work and it's hard sometimes to break away from it. So I know, and you were very... Um, very generous with your time and also sending me um, suggestions for for what you know what you're working on that I so I could read ahead of time and um, you know um, just yeah thank you so much for putting my all the energy into it I really appreciate it and my welcome my back to Ohio State and I am so sorry that it's a pandemic for you to be experiencing Columbus again but welcome back to Columbus as well. Thanks so much. I mean, thanks so much. I mean, we are enjoying. I mean, we didn't miss the cold, but 
So we are trying to get used to it as well. <laughs> <laughs> no one misses that, but um, hopefully, hopefully you'll find some things to do here. So, okay, everyone, I'm going to end so the much. broadcast now.